Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. It's a great pleasure to join you today to talk about a topic that we've been hearing about endlessly over the past five years. Uh, the recession, its impact on unemployment, people are still out of work, people have lost homes, and many remain mired in unpayable debt. Five years since a worse recession since the Great Depression began, so we've had our politicians talking to us endlessly about debts and deficits. But what about the human costs of these responses? What about the impact of these economic changes on health. Together with my colleague, Dr. Sanjay Basu, we've been mining large data sets over the past decade to understand how large economic shocks affect people's health from the Great Depression through to the present crisis. And what we found, to give away our punchline, is that while recessions can hurt, what ultimately matters is how politicians respond. And when they respond to hardship with deep, indiscriminate cuts, they can turn economic suffering into severe epidemics. This is uh, Kieran McArdle at the ripe age of 13. He's already bitter. He blames the government for killing his father. This is a severe charge. His father had worked for two decades as a security guard. But in 2011, just after Christmas, he suffered a severe stroke at the age of 57 leaving him paralyzed, blind in one eye, and unable to speak. It forced him to turn to the government for help to support his family. That government, in the hands of the coalition party, would prove no friend to the McArdles. In a drive to cut deficits created by the financial crisis and the bailout of banks, uh, David Cameron, prime minister, went on a drive against welfare scroungers, people believed to be cheating the system. So they hired Atos, a French systems integration firm, to conduct fitness for work screenings, awarding a 400 million pound contract. Karen's father, like several hundred thousand in the UK, were called in to be screened. Karen's father, Brian, like many, was worried as he had heard that the screenings were being conducted in buildings that were not uh, wheelchair accessible, often on the second floor. But he made it to the test and <coughs> tried his best. A few weeks later, uh, a brown envelope came through the post notifying Brian McArdle that his benefits had been cut. The next day, he dropped dead of a heart attack. It was extremely difficult as a public health researcher to understand the government's logic. What I have here is a data sheet from the Department for Work and Pensions estimating the cost of fraud among persons who are disabled receiving income support for conditions of entitlement. And as you can see, the amount of expenditure overpaid in the year that Karen's budgets were cut was estimated at around two million pounds for conditions of entitlement whereas the contract for Atos was over 400 million. This and other responses to the economic crisis have been extremely difficult to understand outside the context of the politics of debt and austerity. What we do is look at natural experiments to try to understand what happens causally to people's health based on political decisions. And already, the economic effects of the austerity experiments unfolding across Europe and North America are becoming clear. Here I have the US and the UK, two countries that had large financial sectors, placing them at the center of the global banking crisis. And indeed, both suffered a major shock towards the end of 2008 after the fall of Lehman Brothers triggered a cascade that engulfed Europe's financial sector. And early on, President Barack Obama responded with a large stimulus package, investing more than 800 
billion US dollars to shore up social safety nets, uh, protecting people from homelessness and helping people return to work. Whereas in the UK, under the coalition government in 2010, Chancellor Osborne began a large austerity drive, initially aiming to cut 83 billion pounds from the budget. The consequences, as I said, are becoming clear. That marked a turning point in the UK's feeble recovery. And since the UK's economy has yet to recover, there's a strong correlation of social welfare spending and life expectancy, all-cause mortality. What you can see is that societies that invest more in social welfare supports have better health outcomes. And as I'll show in this talk, this is not a mere correlation, but a powerful cause and effect relationship that manifests across societies and over time. To test our hypothesis that austerity hurts, we've looked at some of the test cases in Europe. Greece is arguably Europe's poster child of austerity. Uh, it suffered a large economic recession, uh, had an initial demand shock uh, from drying up of exports of olives, olive oil, and cotton. And early in the recession, tourists stopped coming to its shores. That alone would have been enough to tip most economies into recession. But Greece then faced another shock, a real number shock, as it was found that much of the Greek economic data was simply made up numbers, uh, spurred with the help of Goldman Sachs uh, to hide away government deficits that led to Greece's fraudulent entry into the EU back in 2000. But in this climate, climate of panic and uncertainty about the numbers, what ultimately has hurt Greece's economy has been a large austerity shock. In healthcare, Greece's politicians have placed the onus of the cuts. Uh, a journalist asked the health minister, uh, Andreas Loverdos, in 2011, is it really true that you're looking to cut health budgets by 40%. And the minister said, these cuts are difficult. They're not happening with a surgical scalpel, but with a butcher's knife, cutting both fat and lean. The impetus for these cuts were the large bailout packages from the so-called Troika, the European Central Bank, uh, the European Commission, and the International Monetary Fund, aiming to meet a target of 6% health spending as a fraction of GDP. That's a level lower than Germany, which spends around 10%. The NHS which spends less, around 8% of GDP, and the US, which spends 19%. It was not doctors or healthcare professionals who came up with the plan for restructuring Greece's health system, but economists. It's like trying to uh, re-engineer your car without the aid of a, a car mechanic. Already, the consequences of these severe cuts are becoming clear. Greece is the only country in Europe to have suffered a large HIV outbreak. New infections have risen by more than 200%. This is not the only outbreak. In a paper we published in The Lancet, we've documented a series of harms. After mosquito spraying budgets were cut, Greece suffered a return of malaria, which had previously been eradicated since 1974. As austerity drove youth unemployment up further to more than one in two, now standing close to 60%, of youth, we've seen a knock-on rise in suicides. Uh, Greece is at, used to have one of the lowest rates of suicide in Europe. That figure uh, in our initial paper we reported as a 60% rise. It's since doubled and continued to increase as more people have lost jobs from deep public sector cuts. Many of the job cuts have been in the health sector. More than 35,000 public health workers and doctors have lost their jobs from the austerity budget. Uh, the consequences are being felt by patients who find that public clinics are overrun and overstretched. Uh, Greeks are now turning to street clinics originally designed to cater for immigrants, uh, but now street clinics organized by Médecins Frontier are primarily catering to persons of Greek origin. And I could go on about this devastating set of statistics. Many of the outbreaks that Greeks is facing will cost more to control HIV, malaria, tuberculosis than could have been to prevent. We're continuing our analysis, we've looked at other societies that experienced big economic crash. Here another test case is Iceland. Uh, if you were in the country in Octu October 2008, your television program would have been interrupted by Prime Minister Gerhard, uh, 
pictured here in his signature blue blazer. The walk white letters came on the screen saying, God bless Iceland. As Prime Minister Hard began his speech, all three of Iceland's biggest banks had failed. The worst banking crisis relative to the size of an economy ever recorded. Debt jumped to 800% of GDP, the biggest figure in North America and Europe, and the Iceland, fearing national bankruptcy, had nowhere to turn but the International Monetary Fund for support. But then something unusual happened. More than 10% of Iceland's population took to the streets in protest against the plan to finance bankers' greed and recklessness with deep cuts to its budget. If an equivalent storm had happened here in the UK, it would be as though six million people descended on the House of Commons and House of Lords in protest of austerity. The health minister of Iceland at the time resigned rather than implement the 30% budget cuts to health that were being called for. And the president of this island nation took a radical step. He called for a public referendum, the first since 1944. In March 2010, 93% of Icelanders voted against large budget cuts to finance banker bailouts. Again in 2011, another referendum was held. That time, 60% of the population voted against it. Instead, Iceland's leaders boosted support in its healthcare system at a time of economic hardship to cope with the rising prices of imported medicines. And we found, thanks to these positive steps, no one in Iceland <coughs> lost access to health care, even amid a terrible economic shock. That's not the only sign. Looking across markers of the society's health, we found no rise in suicides, no significant increase in depression among working age men, the highest risk group. In fact, we've seen some counterintuitive benefits from the recession. And in the World Happiness Report, the first published in 2011, Iceland, which was in 2006 rated as the happiest society in the world, once again came near the top of the list and was the leader in positive affect, one of the indicators for how happy people feel in 2011. When the International Monetary Fund caught news of Iceland's uh, unorthodox yet highly successful recovery, quickly turned tail, praising the results. The IMF has been the fastest nation to emerge from the economic recession. Last year, its growth was at 4% of GDP. Unemployment is below 5%. In stark contrast to Greece in the dotted line. The contrast shows that even a major economic crisis need not lead to an increase in death rates. Where does that leave the UK? Many of the cuts being pursued are just now beginning to take effect. And what we've seen in the 2011 and 2012 budget, here I've plotted it against an index of mo multiple deprivation. Each dot in this plot is a different local area, is that these cuts are concentrated in the most deprived regions of the UK. Some of the early warning signs are being felt in areas of mental health. Some of you may have heard the tragedy of Miss Stephanie Bottrill, uh, an elderly woman who had lived in subsidized housing uh, two weekends ago. The bedroom tax led to an increase in her rent in a home she had been living in for more than two decades and in which she had raised her, her daughters. Uh, led to a 25% increase in tax, leaving her in an untenable position. Uh, last week, two weekends ago, she had packed up her belongings the eve before she was being forced to move out. And the next day, instead of leaving, she threw herself in front of a lorry. It's one tragedy of more than a thousand excess economic suicides we've seen already in the UK's recession. Here are the numbers we published in the British Medical Journal, where you can see that suicides here in the red had been falling through 2007, just before the crisis. And with the rise in unemployment, began to spike again. What I haven't depicted here are the statistics just released from 2011, which show as unemployment rose again with deep public sector job cuts, so too have suicides been on the rise. 
homelessness, another early indicator of the most vulnerable groups bearing the brunt of cuts, was falling through the foreclosure crisis and through the recession under the labor government. Then in 2010, following the first of cuts to social housing budgets, a part of which is the kind that led to the tragedy of Mrs. Bottrell, we've seen a 40% increase in the UK in homelessness. It's too early to draw strong conclusions, but uh, London has experienced rises in tuberculosis, often concentrated in homeless persons, drug users, and people who have a cluster of, of high-risk economic suffering. To further test our hypothesis that austerity is deadly, we have drawn on the benefit of historical crises to understand natural experiments. Why is it when faced with a similar economic shock do countries end up with widely varying outcomes? And what role do political choices play? We've tested our hypothesis looking at the Great Depression. And here you can see trends in mortality rates in the late 1920s, right when the Great Crash happened. What may come as a surprise to some of you is that even though suicide rates rose, overall, as you can see, mortality fell by about 10% in the Great Depression. What mattered substantially was, again, how politicians responded. For in the Great Depression, at a time when debt was 180% of GDP, President Franklin Roosevelt introduced <coughs> a new deal to the American people, uh, including a works program administration, which helped 8.5 million Americans get back into jobs, uh, a public housing program, which saved more than a million Americans from homelessness. And what we found was another a natural experiment. As some states that uh, were red in the US, which is Republican, or blue, which is Democrat, went to differing degrees in implementing the New Deal. We saw it lead to a polarization in health outcomes across the nation, where those governors of US states that introduced more relief spending, uh, built hospitals, schools, expanded public health infrastructure, have reductions in suicides, significant drops in pneumonias, and declining infant deaths to a much greater degree than those governors that avoided the New Deal. Now, of course, not everyone agrees with our interpretation of the data. Uh, looking to the British Medical Journal in November 2012, a Greek uh, economist, Dr. Lyropoulos, wrote in, that no hard evidence has proven that crisis has become a health hazard, citing that the budget reductions in Greece were a positive result of improvements in financial management efficiency. Uh, we, we struggled to understand Dr. Lyropoulos' position because just that week, Dr. Mark Springer of the European Center for Disease Control had concluded from his trip of hospitals around the country that he had seen places where the financial package didn't even allow for the most basic of equipment. That there were shortages of surgical gloves and was raising the alarm for the spread of drug-resistant bugs in hospitals. Dr. Friedman, uh, US director of HIV AIDS research, came to a similar conclusion that the Greek government were creating an epicenter for the spread of HIV in all of Europe. Again, we couldn't understand why Dr. Lyropoulos was defending the indefensible until we realized he was an advisory member for the Troika's health budget cuts and released his paper in the BMJ right when the bad news came out from Reuters. Even the I International Monetary Fund has uh, begun to turn tail on the program it's advised for Greece. Its chief economist, Olivier Blanchard, has now publicly said, we underestimated the negative effect of austerity on job losses and the economy. They had assumed, uh, without using hard data, that uh, an obscure statistic known as the fiscal multiplier, that's the effect of government spending on the economy, was about 0.5. Uh, that would mean that austerity would be expansionary, that austerity would help the economy grow. Uh, a figure above one means austerity would be uh, involutionary shrink the economy. When the IMF re-estimated the multipliers, they found a multiplier of about 1.2. Uh, we've estimated a slightly higher multiplier from this recession of 1.7. But we went a step further, and we looked at how different types of government spending affect the economy, as depicted in this forest plot. And what we found 
is that investments in health, education, have some of the biggest returns on investment, some of the biggest economic bang for your buck, which is intuitive because in overstretched systems, the money is rapidly absorbed to provide deep stimulus through jobs, purchasing power, all while providing valuable services that protect nation's health. In contrast, defense and bank bailouts uh, tended to shrink the economy, having smaller and sometimes negative fiscal multipliers as money tends to exit the economy, ending up in offshore tax havens or uh, going to foreign contractors. Just hammering the point home, what we found in this graph is that those countries that spent the most in this recession, opting for stimulus over austerity, have had a faster recovery depicted here in the change in their GDP. So what I argue is there is an alternative to austerity, and one that we've seen in recessions present, but also past. At a time of arguably the greatest hardship in the UK, post-World War II, Beveridge, in his landmark report, called to attack five giants in society, founding the welfare state in Britain at a time when debt was more than 200% of GDP. And Iron Bevan, uh, on founding the NHS, noted that despite our financial and economic anxieties, we're still able to do the most civilized thing in the world, putting welfare of the sick in front of every other consideration. What we call for in Europe, in the UK, North America, is a new New Deal that builds on the successes seen in the data from past and present responses to the crisis. And to be effective, it would follow three main principles. First, do no harm. This ancient law of higher healing, of the healing professions, should guide economic policy. Had austerity been run and organized like a clinical trial, it would have been discontinued given evidence of its deadly side effects. We should set up an office of health responsibility staffed with economists and epidemiologists to monitor and disclose publicly the health effects of economic crisis and government choices. The second is to help people return to work. Uh, we should treat unemployment like the pandemic it is, a leading cause of suicides, alcoholism, depression, anxiety, to name a few. And the last principle should come as no surprise to my colleague, Dr. McCoy, is to invest in public health. It's a wise choice in the best of times and an urgent necessity in the worst of times. Austerity in health is a false economy. Despite promises the NHS budget would be preserved, we've seen real cuts here in the UK. What we've learned in our studies over the past decade is that severe, indiscriminate cuts to health and social protection are not only self-defeating, but fatal. Thank you very much.